and we're back with our discussion on CTGs. In my previous video, we're discussing how to interpret a CTG, and we use the mnemonic Dr. C. Bravado. So as a quick recap, we have the fine risk, contractions, baseline rate, variability, accelerations, decelerations, and overall assessment. If you've forgotten this, take a look at my previous video. So moving on from where we left off, we need to discuss the decelerations next. But first we're going to take a look at some fetal physiology to understand better what decelerations are all about. So we need to understand how a fetus reacts to situations of hypoxia during labor. Now a normal adult would react to hypoxia simply by increasing their respiratory rate to increase the oxygen levels in the blood. But of course, this is not possible for a fetus submerged in amniotic fluid. So what happens? When a fetus is faced with hypoxia, as you said, it is unable to increase its respiratory rate, so instead it decreases the myocardial workload to use up less oxygen. It does this by decreasing the heart rate, which results in a deceleration. So the aim here is to decrease the amount of oxygen being used up by the heart and divert it to other vital organs, such as the brain. If this doesn't work, next the fetus will try to conserve its energy and the oxygen available by not moving. As we know, fetal movements are portrayed as accelerations on the CTG, as movements result in an increased heart rate. So when the fetus stops moving to conserve energy, we will notice a lack of accelerations on the CTG. Now, if hypoxia progresses, the fetus will start to release catecholamines, adrenaline and noradrenaline. And this will help the fetus to conserve further oxygen in three ways. So first the catecholamines will induce an increase in fetal heart rate, which will help to get more oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus. So we will notice an increase in the baseline fetal heart rate. Catecholamines will also result in peripheral vasoconstriction therefore diverting oxygen to the vital organs. Lastly, catecholamines will also induce breakdown of glycogen to glucose to increase the energy available to be used by the fetal heart. All in all, this leads to a compensated response. Therefore, in the end, on the CTG we will see a stable baseline rate with reassuring variability. Now, at some point, these compensating mechanisms will give way and the fetus will be too tired to keep up and decompensation will ensue. First, hypoxia to the brain will result in reduced variability on the CTG. Then we will get myocardial hypoxia and acidosis, which will result in an unstable baseline and what is described as a stepwise pattern to death. This will of course result in an abnormal CTG. Now, fetal physiology may not be the easiest to understand, so here's a mnemonic to help you with the CTG stages. So this is the ABCDE approach to predict the next change in the CTG. So first of all, hypoxia will start off by giving us decelerations on the CTG. A. Accelerations is up here. B. Baseline heart rate increases. C. The fetus goes into a state of compensated stress with a stable baseline heart rate and normal variability. D, the fetus gets too tired and goes into decompensation with an unstable baseline and changes in variability. And E, the end stage with a myocardial failure and a step ladder pattern to death. Okay, so now that we've got our physiology sorted, let's go back to the decelerations. First of all, decelerations are defined as a drop in the fetal heart rate by more than 15 beats per minute for more than 15 seconds. And we've got three types. These are the early, variable and late decelerations, and we're going to look into each one. So starting off with early decelerations. The trough of the deceleration coincides with the peak of the contraction. So early decelerations start when the uterine contraction begins and recovers when the uterine contraction stops. They are secondary to head compression. 
So during a uterine contraction, there is an increase in fetal intracranial pressure, which results in increased vagal tone, decreasing the heart rate. The deceleration then quickly resolves once the uterine contraction ends. These are relatively uncommon and are considered physiological and not pathological, so they are nothing to worry about. Okay, so next we've got the variable decelerations now, and these are the most common type of deceleration. They are termed variable as they vary in their shape, form, and timing in relation to contractions. They typically have a rapid fall in baseline heart rate with a variable recovery phase. Variable decelerations are usually caused by umbilical cord compression. So let's take a deeper look into what happens and how this relates to the findings we see on the CTG over here. So as we know, the umbilical cord is composed of an umbilical vein and two umbilical arteries. When pressure is applied on the umbilical cord, the umbilical vein is occluded first as it is a low pressure vessel. This causes an acceleration of the fetal heart in response. Next, the umbilical artery is occluded causing a deceleration now on the CTG. When pressure on the cord is then released, another acceleration occurs and the fetal heart returns to baseline. These accelerations before and after the variable deceleration are referred to as shouldering and they indicate that the fetus is not yet hypoxic and is compensating well. So, as we said previously, variable decelerations vary a lot in their shape, form, and timing. There are particular characteristics of variable decelerations which are concerning and a sign that the baby is getting tired. These include if the deceleration lasts for more than 60 seconds, if the deceleration has a biphasic shape, which basically looks like a W, as we can see over here. Next, no shouldering is another concerning characteristic. As we described previously, shouldering is a sign that the fetus is compensating well. Then other concerning characteristics include reduced baseline variability within the deceleration and the failure to return to baseline. These are all signs that worry us. Okay, so lastly, we have the lay decelerations. So essentially, these begin at the peak of the uterine contraction and recover after the contraction ends. Lay decelerations are bad news and they indicate insufficient blood flow to the uterus and placenta. Uteroplacental insufficiency results in reduced blood flow to the fetus, causing fetal hypoxia and acidosis. Uteroplacental insufficiency may be secondary to maternal hypotension, preeclampsia or uterine hyperstimulation. So those were the CTG basics. Stay tuned for the next video as we go through the overall assessment of a CTG. Like and subscribe.